Hey everyone, this is Nicholas Peter, and I wanted to show you guys really quick this website, wedobetter.org. And I found out about this organization. It's a 501c4 organization. I found out about them from from the Anarchist episode, We Do Better Than Government Services with Dan Johnson. And Dan Johnson right here, he is the one who created the organization. And I watched this whole video. This one was back in April 27th. 2018 so just a little over a year ago and it was very inspiring it was very interesting it was talking about in how in Arizona they have a tax credit and they've had it for like 20 years where if you got say like a thousand dollars stolen from you from the government you actually had a tax credit in place to where maybe you could take 200 of that that was already taken from you you had no choice in the matter but you were able to take at least 200 of that that was already taken and put those in the organizations that are in your local area or in your state that are like 501c3 organizations and put it to good use like on the ground level and put it into places that that you were looking into and that you were passionate about and wanted to support so it's more of a uh, getting people just more involved in where the funds are going and looking into those types of organizations and seeing that wow I have five in my area I, I never even knew they existed and so that's the whole problem is that we just think oh well the government's taking care of it they're going to be the ones that feed the homeless and do all this other stuff but in reality it's there's more grassroots organizations that are really doing a great job and putting all the resources that they can to practical use like they're not going to be like the Red Cross where like 50% say or however much percent that gets donated it doesn't even go towards the actual helping of people it just goes towards like paying people and doing all this other stuff and a lot of more of the maybe the marketing so like not, not all the donations go towards the actual thing that they're donating for so there's a lot of great organizations out there which they will show in, in this website but um so there are thousands of organizations that meet human needs in the United States already so food banks provide emergency food Homeless shelters give someone a place to stay for the night. Free clinics provide health care for families. Hundreds of thousands of nonprofits and other organizations serve nearly every human need in the United States. So, if, you want, if we want to address human needs in our communities, why aren't we using the best methods for providing, of providing for them? So, many of these organizations deliver better outcomes than government programs. That's the key thing. These organizations have to earn the money they spend, ensuring that both those who pay for them and those who receive services get what they need. However, many Americans are not aware of these organizations. And these organizations often have a limited amount of resources to meet people's needs. So here are the fundamental flaws. Ooh. Huh. So if we go to the We Do Better, go to Fundamental Flaws, there we go. The eight fundamental flaws of the government provision of public services. So We Do Better is concerned with optimizing the human outcomes delivered by our public services. In most areas of life, to improve an outcome, we compare the available means of achieving it and choose the best one. Remarkably, however, when it comes to providing the services on which we all rely, we don't do that. When most people think of the provision of public services, they don't think about the, the method that provides the best, the best results or even the most services. Rather, they think about the method to which most resources are directed. That method involves government agencies funded by taxation. It has eight fundamental flaws from the first follow all the rest. So, coercive. We do not get to choose how much money to give to government based on its efficiency, impact, or results. The same amount of money will be taken from us regardless and spent in ways that we cannot directly determine and cannot be quickly changed. It guarantees perpetual revenue. Since we have no choice in how much government takes from us, government can and does receive at least the same amount of revenue every year. Therefore, it has no practical need or incentive to curb waste, spend wisely, or correct poor outcomes. So, massive, massively concentrates money and power. Collecting money through coercive or coercion ensures that only a small number of people make decisions about how large amounts of our money is spent. This makes it worthwhile for special interests to seek favors from politicians, which is the essence of political corruption. Disincentivizes quality and social services. 
Since we cannot send our tax money elsewhere, government does not have to maintain or increase the quality of its services to continue receiving revenue. Organizations that address human needs more effectively or efficiently than government agencies are frequently underfunded or never get funded at all. Moreover, this prevents us from fairly judging the effectiveness of government solutions against better solutions, and the quality of government solution uh, and the quality of government solutions falls unchecked. Great points, absolutely fantastic points. So, does not respond to real-world outcomes. Since the collection of money is independent of the human consequences of how it is spent, there is no incentive to measure or respond to the outcomes of that spending. This money is spent in a manner that does not consider the individual circumstances of the people it affects, fails to deliver on intended outcomes, and has in unintended consequences, all of which often go unmeasured. Increases waste. Since government has perpetual revenue, it has no incentive to minimize waste. Most organizations have to minimize waste to provide quality services with limited resources because they must compete with other organizations for revenue. Since government has no need to minimize waste, it can and does continually add red tape, bureaucracy, and middlemen that do not contribute to better outcomes from its services. So it lacks accountability. We cannot vote with our tax dollars. We have no direct say in how our money is spent, and we cannot direct it anywhere else if promised outcomes are not delivered. We cannot keep government accountable by directing our money or more to more effective means. Therefore, the mechanism of accountability that we rely on everywhere else is missing. It makes us less likely to act on our compassion. Since government revenue is taken coercively, it makes us less likely to give to human needs. Our tax dollars uh, are supposed to be funding. When money is taken coercively, we lose the gift of, gift of giving, and it reduces our resources to meet human needs otherwise. This also gives us the false impression that our responsibilities to each other are already being met, diminishing our incentive to meet the needs of others. It's important to understand the advantages and disadvantages of the various ways we provide public services, because only then can we effectively discuss, let alone choose, the ones that provide the best human outcomes. And so, this gentleman is an anarchist. That's why he was on Anarchast. And this way of thinking and presenting it to people, it is, it breaks down all the barriers of politics. Because deep in the heart of the matter, everyone wants to to have people get their needs met, you know? And so in a kind of system like this where we're not being coerced and the, we don't have a, an organization that's just gonna get perpetual income no matter what, so then we have organizations that have accountability. They need to be resourceful. And if they aren't resourceful, then we'll find someone else who is. And so they have to keep, and, and the people that are within those small, more grassroots organizations are really passionate and they want to do the best job they can. You know, they're not trying to just get cash from people and just pocket it themselves and then maybe put like a little bit towards something because that won't last very long. And that's not what their true purpose is for most of the cases. And then it dis, uh, disincentivizes quality and social services. I mean, that's. Uh, just the point I was making like it just makes it to where there's no accountability so they feel like they can just do whatever they want it doesn't matter because they're gonna keep getting revenue as it is and then does not respond to real real world outcomes they don't even measure how well they're doing percentage wise and fails to deliver and increases waste lacks accountability and then people think that it's already being done like we, the government's doing it so it's all okay so this this is a great page right here um, especially if you just want to talk to people about why the taxing of us coercively, it's, it's a violent action, is not right. And so why we do better. So providing the best public services isn't just about deploying more resources. It's about deploying our resources in the most effective way. Key point. We do better is about identifying those people, organizations, and methods that provide the best and most accessible public services and enabling communities to direct resources with the goal of improving human outcomes. If we, if we do better as all of us, it's the we and we the people. Americans freely come together in many kinds of groups to serve each other. Indeed, throughout the Western world, almost all human needs are met through a myriad of transactions voluntarily made by individuals, often in groups, and usually for mutual, but not always, material benefit. So a trip to the farmer's market provides a simple example. 
You want apples more than you want the money you use to buy them, and the farmer wants your money more than the apples. Both of you benefit from the exchange of money for apples, and so both of you naturally say thank you to each other after it is made. The power and beauty of such exchanges lie in the fact that they only happen if both people benefit. Over time, millions of such free exchanges build civilization and are responsible for most of our welfare. For example, they are responsible for the production and supply of food, clothes, electrical power, our homes, transportation, medical treatments, and most modern forms of communication, all public services of which, on which we depend. Our society includes various entities that are formed to meet human needs through this mechanism. They include non-government organizations, mutual societies, companies, and informal groups. So NGOs. NGOs provide all manner of social services, such as homeless shelters, support for abused children, food or medical care for the poor, psychological support for addicts, and so on. An NGO is a corporation whose shareholders do not make profits and that measures its success measures its success in terms of a benefit to the community. The choice to give money to a charity or non-government organization is entirely voluntary and both the giver and the NGO benefit. Clearly the NGO benefits from donations which it spends to do good in the community. Although the giver does not often gain materially, she gains something even more valuable than the money she gives. A benefit that could be described as spiritual, emotional, or just human. As Shakespeare said, giving is twice blessed. In many areas where private charity operates with the same purpose as a government program, the charity does more good for less money. Simple. There's a simple reason for that. If a charity stops doing the good it claims to do, then its donors can cease to support it. In other words, the choice of how to spend one's money turns good intentions into even better outcomes. So imagine that. People just think, oh, well, if we just stop getting taxed at all, then everyone would just hoard all the cash they had. Some of them, some people, yes. But that's what do you think happens when you're under control for such a long period of time for everyone it's basically their entire lives we've been under this kind of control so naturally you're gonna maybe you might swing that pendulum to the other side you might not give anything for a bit just because you're just not used to having all of your funds available to you and for you to be able to spend it at your discretion so yeah there will be some people that do that for me personally I mean I've donated I, I go on patreon I support like at least 10 people on there um, I've donated to people like Mark Passio. I've donated to We Do Better. I'm actually going to get that uh, monthly payment going again because ever since I changed my uh, my debit card, I haven't been donating. So I'm definitely going to be doing that. And um, so yeah, it's it's great. It just makes it just makes a lot of sense. Uh, Co-ops and mutual societies, whereas an NGO receives donation from some people which it uses to the benefit of others, a mutual society or co-op involves multiple people coming together for their collective benefit. Members of a co-op put funds into a pot when they can afford to, so as to be able to take them out when they need to. Accordingly, these organizations provide a kind of insurance and, on top of that, allow the members to benefit further from any profits. Because those who benefit from co-op's resources provided those resources in the first place, everyone involved has an incentive to ensure there is no waste and only policies that really serve the members can be implemented. Moreover, the natural self-policing of such an organization mitigates against abuse. So imagine that. Imagine if we just ran our society like that. A co-op, mutual societies, where we all are linked in together, and we all benefit mutually to different extents, but we want to have that safety net, like people always say. you know, We want to have a safety net in case something happens to someone. Yeah, well, there's different ways that we can go about doing that. Like, a lot of our um, ability to imagine any other sort of different way of doing things has just been completely locked down. Like, we just can't think of any other way of doing something just because it's been this way for so long. Like, the schooling system, from what I've been hearing, when they first tried to implement it, 80% of people didn't even want to have it where it was compulsive. But now it's like everyone's defending it as if this is the end-all be-all. This is the only way we can go about doing anything. And it's just not the case. You just have to look out there. You know, you just, just because something's being done right now doesn't mean you should just throw up your arms and say, eh, this is the best we can do. Because there's, the information's out there. You just got to have the willpower to look. And if it's something you value, you will look into it. So that's a great point that he made about co-ops and mutual societies. And then for-profit corporations. 
The overwhelming majority of the products and services that Americans require are provided by for-profit corporations, which directly provide a needed product or service for money. Like the farmer at the farmer's market, a company must provide value to customers to make a profit, so its interests are aligned with those of the people that it serves. Some companies like supermarkets, utility companies, and transportation companies support the basic welfare, welfare of millions of Americans. Since profit-making, corporations must compete with others who can take their business by offering the same or better product for the same price or less, they can have an incentive to meet the public's needs more effectively and more affordably over time, and even find ways to meet needs that are not met by anyone else. So like in terms of like Aldi, when I was talking maybe to the district manager about the food waste, she said that um, making cash, making a profit is more important than the food waste. And I understand that, like, for sure. But it's, it doesn't belittle the food waste at all. And Aldi did do a lot of donating, but, I mean, there was still plenty of stuff that was perfectly fine that we were throwing out. So it's, like, for, like, the broad point that it's making on this one, I for sure agree. I mean, the way the competition is, there's plenty of other places that people can shop, which is why I don't shop at Aldi, which is why I don't shop at Walmart. Which is why I don't shop at Jewel, which is why I don't shop at most of the places. <laughs> like, it's hard to find a place that I really want to shop at and support. So, um, yeah, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And then the give and take, because people can get jobs there and stuff like that. So that makes sense. Informal organizations of individuals. Modern technology allows individuals with a common interest to organize and raise resources for various purposes. Crowdfunding sites are increasingly used to fund causes and create ways of meeting human needs. Social media, such as Twitter and Facebook, have been used with huge success to respond to crises. For example, Louisiana's Cajun Navy, organized through a Facebook group, is an informal organization of boat-owning citizens who rescue victims of the floods that frequently strike the state. There are many like it. The above types of organizations represent various ways people come together, come together to serve themselves and each other, to promote well-being in our communities, we need to be aware of all of them so we can use those that provide the best human outcomes in each area of public services. So that's just where doing a little digging can help. Because then you can find those places like the diamond in the rough. And you can be like, oh, wow, and maybe shine light on it. Maybe you know some people that are kind of have the same interests in, as you, and maybe they're not aware of a certain organization. So it's just great all around. So doing the most good. We do better as morally committed to human to better human outcomes, not ideologically committed to a particular method of achieving them. Accordingly, we support and strengthen those we rely on public services by supporting and strengthening those who do better in providing them. In every case, when it comes to public services, we have a moral responsibility to do the most good with every dollar spent. Let us start measuring our compassion not by the strength of our good intentions, the efforts we make, or even the money we spend, but by the good that we do for each other very great point so we got examples so we got anti-poverty we got Kiva it's a website Kiva it's been 12 years in service it's uh, worldwide services provided micro loans for low-income borrowers Kiva is a microfinance company founded in 2005 since that time Kiva has connected 1.6 million lenders with 2.6 million borrowers loaning out over $1 billion to those who need it most. Their loans have a 90% repayment rate, meaning people are being lifted out of poverty instead of perpetually stuck in it. Let's look at some other ones. Disaster Relief, the Cajun Navy. So they've been 12, so that's the Facebook group. So they have a website, uh, 12 years in service. Their service area is Alabama, Florida, Louisiana, and Texas. As it was saving, it was helping out people in places that usually get hit with those kind of disasters. Emergency rescue during natural disasters, disasters such as floods and hurricanes. So how do they do better? The Cajun Navy was formed in 2005 after the failed federal response to Hurricane Katrina. Since then, this informal group of volunteers has rescued people in several disasters, including the Louisiana floods of 2014 and Hurricane Harvey, where Cajun Navy volunteers using social media and mobile apps rescued over 6,000 people from the flooding arriving days before the government and surpassing 4,500 rescues made by the U.S. Coast Guard. <laughs> that is absolutely phenomenal. That's great. 
So we got education. And uh, this one's interesting because they actually have a few of these. This is a cryptocurrency. It's called Library. And it's been two years in service. It's worldwide and it's a free online educational content. In 2016, the University of Berkeley took down 20,000 free online lectures in response to a lawsuit by the Department of Justice over impaired access instead of updating the lectures for those with disabilities. Library saved the lectures and placed the content online for free. So that's, that's great. 20,000 free online lectures. Who knows how long each one of those was, you know? So that's a lot of hours of information right there. And this is where I, I found out about Big Brothers Big Sisters. I tried applying for them, but I'm not sure what happened. They never got back to me. But uh, that's great. 114 years in service, nationwide youth mentoring. It's one of the America's oldest youth mentoring organizations and pairs adult mentors with at-risk children. Children and Big Brothers Big Sisters are 40 46% less likely to use illegal drugs, 27% less likely to use alcohol underage, 52% less likely to skip school, and 33% less likely to engage in violence. So we got food security, health care, housing and shelter, infrastructure, justice, labor, protection, the environment, workforce development. uncategorized and so this has been updated a little bit since I've been here since the last time I looked at it because there's a bit more um, yeah we got resources Arizona taxable credit so this has the video on here which I also have on their YouTube channel we do better public services that change lives Arizona's charitable tax credit so let's just play a, a one-minute clip be a part of the day that person is signed the lease and gets a set of keys and you get to be a part of collecting a donation of a mattress and sheets and a pillow and you know that that person is going to wake up um, in their own space without the sound of other people or the, of the strangers or the sound of um, the birds you know, that kind of stuff. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a really big deal. You get to be a part of really changing somebody's life in this really impactful way. And um, we do so much of that with this unrestricted support. Um, that's really how we get it done, so. Sorry. Uh, both sides of the aisle were able to look at this and to see the potential benefit. And whether you be Democrat or Republican, I think you probably do truly care about people who may be hungry or homeless. Without our so yeah, this is a, only a nine minute, 46 second video. It's great. It's really cool hearing some of the testimony. And you can, you can just see in the woman's face just from, just from her speaking for a minute. Like she's a completely genuine person. And this is something that she's really passionate about. This is her vocation. You know, this is what she was meant to do is to help other people and provide them with shelter and finding them a place to stay for the night or a day or two and it's people like the thing that most human be like most people in america don't really care but it's like there's so many people that volunteer today and donate today and imagine if we had all of our funds and it wasn't taken at all imagine the things that we could accomplish and just learning more about these other ways of doing things as well and looking into that more and maybe improving that even more because even though like i see it as a better solution we can improve it to an even greater extent and it's like like the sky's the limit it's just our imagination that's really stopping us from doing it so i actually have uh spoken with dan on the phone a couple times i did want to get involved i kind of i wimped out a little bit it was just a lot to take in having to go to organizations talk with them learn some of the lingo and be able to talk the main points that were needed to be talked about with these people to get them in support and then it's also the it is still working within the political system but i mean it's but it is a step you know it's for sure a step which is why i i want to don't start donating again but uh dan johnson he's a great man 
Um, I don't know him personally, personally, you know, but I've talked with him on the phone for at least a couple hours in total. And, um, yeah, if you guys are interested, just check out this website, get involved. You can start now. You can give your name and email and do you have a passion for any of the following and submit. Feel free to donate if you guys wanted to, a one-time donation. Uh, monthly sustaining membership start at $5. I was doing the $5 a month. Um, they accept Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash. Oh, that's cool. I'm probably going to do that right now. That's that's something new. Um, yeah. So, if you guys like this video, please give it a thumb up. Share it. If you guys think this is really interesting, just the whole concept. Uh, let other people know. The Arizona tax credit, if you live in Arizona, learn more about it. Because they actually have a website where you can go and see like it's all official and you can see the places that you can donate and it's really nice and simple and i think it's just like one extra form or something like that when you do your taxes but yeah i think it's it's a fantastic way to show people the anarchist model without even saying the word anarchist because it's just the way that we're meant to be doing things voluntarily and if people are trying to do morally right and be a moral society we're going to be helping out people i mean we it feels great spiritually you know and all that stuff so yeah feel free please check this out let me know what you guys think if you guys agree or disagree check out the anarchist video we can get a little bit more information for sure and hear it from the horse's mouth from dan johnson himself so uh, i appreciate you guys watching very much and i hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend take care